立法會主席。The President。
Justin. Questions. Question one, Mr. Porter. Mr. James Toll. Uh, I suggest that uh, we have a one. We observe a one minute silence uh, to the uh, ex legislator, Mr. Alan Lee. Mr. James Toll has made this suggestion. Just like um, everyone else, I um, express my condolences to his family, and I feel just as sad. However, the rules stipulate that uh, there will only be an, an observance of minute silence of the uh, death of incumbent legislators. I ask members to uh, express their condolences and in other avenues. J.Y. Chun Yu. Mr. Porter. I do understand about our convention, but I do express my deepest condolences to Mr. Lee's family. President, the social incidents which have persisted for more than half a year have dealt a heavy blow to Hong Kong's economy. Then the coronavirus disease 2019 epidemic, formerly referred to as novel coronavirus infected pneumonia, has swept across the globe, plummeting the global economy and stock markets. Some members of the accounting sector have predicted that if the government does not implement additional relief measures, the economy of Hong Kong may fall further, with bankruptcy and winding up cases reaching a peak in August this year and registering a huge year-on-year -year increase of 20% to 30%. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, whether it will raise the amount of the cash handout to each adult Hong Kong permanent resident to $20,000? and collaborate with the banking sector so that banks may, upon receiving signed authorization forms from individual clients and having verified letters eligibility for receiving the sum, disperse the sum in advance in order to address the urgent needs of members of the public. If so, of the details, if not, the reasons for that. Two, as members of the public filing bankruptcy petitions are currently required to deposit with the official receiver a sum of $8,000 and pay a court fee of $1,045. Whether the government will, in view of the expected surge of bankruptcy, offer concessions on the relevant fees or make such payments on behalf of the persons concerned so, that, so as to prevent more and more people from suffering the hardship of not even being able to make payments for bankruptcy applications. And three. In view of the suggestion made by some senior scholars well versed in real estate and economics that the titles with resale restrictions of the public housing estates uh, units held by the Housing Authority, the total estimated value of which amounts to $100 billion, be transferred for, for free to those sitting tenants in, who have lived there for more than 10 years or so, so that the management and maintenance expenses that are close to $20 billion a year can be saved and relocated to meeting expenses on public housing development and provision of support for the sandwich and middle class. Whether the government will consider this suggestion, if so, of details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury. President, we understand fully that the social events last year and COVID-19 pandemic have brought immense impact to various industries and sectors. The government has launched four rounds of relief measures amounting to more than $30 billion between August and December last year. Since the beginning of this year, three rounds of measures totaling $287.5 billion to assist the affected industries and the public were announced including the first round of $30 billion relief measures under the anti-epidemic fund in February, the $120 billion relief package in the 2020-21 budget, and the second round of $137.5 billion relief measures under the anti-epidemic fund in April. The government will closely monitor the situation in the community and continue to implement countercyclical measures and provide targeted support to enterprises and the general public for riding out the crisis together. Having consulted the Transport and Housing Bureau, our reply to the Honourable Porter is as follows. 1. The cash payout scheme announced by the Financial Secretary in this budget 
will disperse $10,000 to each Hong Kong permanent resident age 18 or over with a view to encouraging and boosting local consumption and relieving people's financial burden. It's expected to benefit about 7 million people. For the amount of disbursement, having thoroughly considered all the countercyclical and mitigation measures and their financial impact, we consider $10,000 an appropriate amount. The preparation work for the scheme has reached its final stage. We will announce the details as soon as possible. Our target is to strive to commence registration at the end of June and start making payment within July. We expect that the majority of the 7 million eligible citizens will receive payment by the end of August. The proposal mentioned in the question by Mr. Jay will also require authorization from the party concerned to use their personal data and to perform verification of eligibility. It will not expedite payment disbursement time in practice. Two. As for people who have filed for bankruptcy, Rule 52 of the Bankruptcy Rules Cap 6A provides that the debtor shall deposit a sum of $8,000 with the official receiver's office upon presentation of bankruptcy petition against themselves. The ORO official receiver's office does not have the discretionary power to waive or reduce deposit. The deposit is for covering costs and expenses in processing the bankruptcy case, for example, the accountable and advanced costs incurred in gazetting and publishing statutory notices, charges for conducting various searches, for example, bank search, land search, and company search, expenses incurred in the service of notices, statutory court fees, etc. In fact, our policy is that the fees charged should in general be set at levels adequate to recover the full costs of providing services to ensure that the costs for providing services do not fall on general taxpayers. It is also a common international practice to require a debtor to pay a deposit upon presentation of bankruptcy petition against themselves. The arrangements in Hong Kong are similar to those adopted in other jurisdictions such as the UK and Singapore. The current amount of deposit for debtors' bankruptcy petition against themselves was revised in 2013 from the then level of $8,650 to $8,000. The ORO will keep in view the cost recovery situation of the relevant services and will consider reviewing the deposit amount where necessary. As for the $1,045 court fee payable to the High Court for filing a debtor's petition, the fee level, same as fees for commencement of other courses or matters, is stipulated in the High Court Fees Rules Cap 4D. 3. Public Rental Housing PRH Units are valuable public assets. Transferring the ownership of PRH units to PRH tenants for free is not in line with the principle of effective use of public money and housing resources, especially amid a public housing supply that can yet to satisfy the demand in society at the moment. Furthermore, transferring the ownership of PRH units to sitting tenants will also drastically reduce the number of PRH units available for allocation which will severely lengthen the waiting time for families applying for PRH. Therefore, the suggestion of transferring the ownership of PRH units for free is not feasible. The greatest challenge in relation to public housing is the shortage of land supply. We will strive to identify land under a multi-pronged approach so as to effectively resolve the housing problem in the long run. We'll also continue to maximize the use of land secured for public housing construction. Furthermore, in recent years, the government has also proposed various short and medium-term support measures to meet people's housing needs and home ownership aspirations. These measures include accelerating the sale of unsold flats in tenant purchase scheme estates, expediting the sale of home ownership scheme and green form subsidized 
Home Ownership Scheme flats, further increasing the quota for White Form Secondary Market Scheme, launching starter homes for Hong Kong residents pilot project, increasing the supply of transitional housing, and on a trial basis, providing a cash allowance to eligible general applicant households who are not living in PRH, not receiving CSSA, and have been waiting for PRH for more than three years. Mr. Jack. First of all, I welcome the Secretary for joining the team. In relation to public housing, I do not expect revol revolutionary ideas from the Secretary. I suggested that 10,000 should be increased to 20,000. From the reply, I get the idea that is a no go. What about something smaller? The fees are for filing bankruptcy petition. The answer said that they have to recover cost. As you know, that uh, court costs far exceed the amount they charged. So $1,065,000 would take you all the way through the court of final appeal. You said that where necessary, uh, they may review the deposit amount. But we're talking about filing for bankruptcy. Well, for MPF, it's a 0.03%. And it has been six years, then there hasn't been much uh, review. It's heavily subsidized by the government. And it may be subsidized heavily by other MPF account holders. Do you expect debtors uh, to borrow from loan sharks in order to file, a bank file for bankruptcy, Secretary? We fully understand that uh, the economic situation in Hong Kong is dire. And in order to secure jobs, protect employment, as well as to relieve measures, we have launched two rounds of measures under the Anti-Epidemic Fund. And we, there is also about uh, $290 billion, accounting for 11% of the GDP in relief measures. We fully understand the plight faced by those who have filed for bankruptcy. But regardless of the economic situation, they face the same difficulties. As I said in my main reply, our policy is that the fees charged should be set at levels adequate to recover the full costs of providing the services to ensure that the costs for providing the service do not fall on general taxpayers. Debtors, when filing for bankruptcy, will have to pay fees. This is a common international practice. When the government provides official receivers service, they have to charge a fee to recover full cost. Of course, the ORO will keep in view the situation and, where necessary, review the deposit amount. They will also take into account uh, the economic situation, consider providing other assistance. Mr. Jimmy Ng. In this year's budget, the government proposed cash payout scheme of distributing $10,000 but they have to wait for two months before they start receiving payments. Maybe it's something good that will turn out to be poorly done. And under the that various measures under the anti-epidemic fund, uh, individuals or companies will have to make applications and the amount dispersed will be posted by maybe check to the individuals. It's like we have gone back to the Stone Age. Will the government use uh, some innovation innovative ideas say for example use some kind of um, standing system so to save from uh, the requirement that they have to make applications every single time i don't see uh, any speedy processing of um, any applications of e-administration it looks like that uh, we are seriously lacking in electronic services they have uh, developed um, the smart ID and all those uh, smart platforms. Uh, will the administration uh, improve these measures in similar schemes in the future? 
currently we're working with different departments and banks preparing for the work we have to develop a, a computer system we have to formulate the uh, workflow we will announce the details as soon as possible during the scrutiny of the appropriation bill we have already started the advanced work as soon as we get the green light for the funding allocation, we can start registration and disbursement as soon as possible. Eligible citizens will only have to go through a simple registration and they may choose to receive checks or a bank transfer. The design of the workflow will be focused on convenience, security, as well as uh, simplicity, so that members of the public will be able to receive the amount in an orderly manner. Members of the public only have to furnish us with simple personal information to complete the registration. The government does not have banking information of uh, 7 million eligible citizens. So without registration, we are unable to disperse the amount. Under the PDPO Personal Data Privacy Ordinance, government uh, co information collected by the government cannot be used for uh, for purposes other than those specified. So we have to uh, we have to have a registration and ask the uh, applicant to furnish us with, with information. It's a very simple process, Mr. Pun Peng. Thank you, Mr. J. Mentioned that according to a prediction of the accounting sector, without additional relief measures, there will be further plummeting of our economy. In, peak, in August this year, the number of bankruptcy cases will reach a peak. He proposed to increase the cash earnout to $20,000. The administration said 10000 is an appropriate amount. We see that the unemployment rate is climbing. The most ideal situation is for an unemployment fun, um, fund to be set up. Has the administration considered launching uh, consumption vouchers to boost consumption sentiment and to help people? Secretary, thank you. Just now, I have told you about the $10,000 cash payout scheme. It aims to relieve people's financial burden. What are the considerations of the scheme? First, to protect our economy and to relieve financial burden of our citizens. I have mentioned in my reply that all the relief measures amount to 10% of our GDP. We hope that amidst the economic downturn, we'll be able to secure jobs and give people peace of mind. Mr. Ronick Chan. Mr. Ho, I'd have to make it clear that I have not participated in any discussions in relation uh, to the cash handout scheme from the banking sector. But if members of the public will have to sign another authorization form to get the $10,000 is an additional process. What about this? After an application is made and verification done, banks can disperse the amount without waiting for government funding allocation. It won't uh, involve a very long time and it will only involve a, a small amount of cost. Would you consider this a this um, suggestion that would expedite the process. Secretary, the, men, the member mentioned about registration. Well, through the registration, members of the public will be asked uh, to allow the government to make use of the information furnished in similar schemes so they don't have to make another registration. We will keep the uh, data collected this time. Dr. Chen Chung Tai. Mr. Porter asked 
in a supplementary that people might have to borrow from a loan shark in order to file a bankruptcy petition. This will be ludicrous. Most people will not want to see that happen. It's very obvious that several categories of people have been left out by the anti-epidemic fund. First, home carers, housewives are responsible for protecting their homes from the epidemic. Second group, casual workers. Three, elderly people who don't have to make contributions to the MPF. I'd like to ask, are there any other measures or a third round to help these three categories of people? Secretary. Between August and December, we have launched four rounds uh, of relief measures amounting to about uh, $330 billion. And there are uh, an additional three more rounds of uh, relief measures, including the $30 billion relief measures under the Anti-Epidemic Fund and in the budget $120 billion relief package. In April, under the second round of the Anti-Epidemic Fund, there are relief measures amounting to $137 billion. This is a sizable sum. We'll keep in view the situation and make use of uh, counter-cyclical measures and targeted support uh, to help enterprises and the public. Mr. Abramshek, thank you. I'd like to follow up on the third part of Mr. Dare's question. In the Secretary's reply, he said that because of scarcity of resources, the government's unable to help PRH tenants. However, in the reply, the Secretary has not mentioned about vacant flats every year. I know that uh, there are over 10,000 of them. We have 1.2 million people living in PRH tenants, and you can give them the uh, 10,000 vacant units. If they can be made to pay for maintenance expenses, the union you can save $20 billion, and it will give them a sense of belonging. There is no substance in your reply. I'll give you another chance to answer again. Transport and Housing Bureau Secretary. I thank the member for the question. In 2019, the Chief Executive mentioned in the policy address that allowing all PRH tenants to purchase their units will, in the short term, reduce the number of uh, flats for allocation and inevitably extend the waiting time. As there is an acute shortage in PRH units, it is difficult for the time being to implement this suggestion. The government will, at the right time, ask the Housing Authority to um, relaunch uh, TPS. Question number two, Mr. Andrew Wen. Mr. President, some members of the public have relayed that recently some police officers who had lost control of the temper when handling public events misbehaved themselves, for instance, hurling abuses at members of the public and reporters, as well as subjecting them to violence. Though the police have indicated that the police officers involved in 21 incidents have been rebuked, those members of the public doubted the effectiveness of this course of action. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, of the number of police officers who were rebuked in each of the past five years, and among them, the number of those who were subsequently imposed other punishments, and the details of such punishments, whether the records of such having been rebuked will affect the promotional prospect and remuneration packages of police officers, and two, as the police have indicated that they have rebuked a traffic police officer who drove a motorcycle into a crowd back and forth in November last year and will rebuke seven police officers who swore at a member of the public on the 8th of March this year, whether the police will take actions apart from rebuking these police officers, such as launching criminal investigations and ordering them to apologize to the victims, and three, 
Although the police have stated time and again that they respect freedom of the press and have reminded police officers to facilitate reporters' news covering work, the number of reporters have expressed that during their news covering activities in the past eight months, police officers repeatedly hindered their news covering work and subjecting them to violence. Whether the police have assessed if the police are able unable to restrain police officers from committing such acts, if they have assessed and the outcome is in the negative, whether the police can undertake that police officers will not hinder reporters' news covering work and treat them violently, Secretary for Security. Since early June last year, Mr. President, more than 1,400 protests, processions and public meetings have been staged in Hong Kong, many of which eventually turned into illegal acts of violence. According to Section 10 of the Police Force Ordinance, Cap 232, it is the statutory duty of the police to maintain public safety and public order. When unlawful acts occur, the police must take actions to maintain public order and safeguard the lives and properties of the public. The police attach great importance to the conduct and behavior of their officers. Police officers must meet requirements on behavior and discipline and must uphold the police's values and areas, including impartiality and professionalism. My reply to various parts of the question is as follows. One and two. The discipline of police officers is regulated by the police discipline regulations. In the past five years, that is, from 2015 and 2019, the figures are as follows. 1. For disciplinary offences which are minor and handled by minor offence reports, there were a total of 362 cases, or on average, 72 reports per year. 2. A total of... 235 officers, or on average 47 officers per year, were awarded punishment upon disciplinary proceedings not falling within one above. Among them, 30 were dismissed, compulsorily retired, or ordered to resign. And three, a total of 100 officers, or on average 20 officers per year, were awarded punishment for criminal convictions. Among them, 55 were dismissed, compulsorily retired or ordered to resign. Apart from regulating officers' discipline, in accordance with the police discipline regulations CAP 232A, the police also manage officers' discipline and conduct through administrative means for immediate intervention and rectification. Rebuke is an administrative measure and is the starting point of the penalty mechanism regarding certain alleged inappropriate behaviour of individual police officers. The Commissioner of Police has rebuked police officers in 22 cases. These cases mainly included the inappropriate use of force, the use of inappropriate language and inappropriate behaviour. Rebukes made by the Commissioner of Police aim to immediately intervene in, stop and rectify the inappropriate behaviour of officers, as well as let other officers know that such behaviour is inappropriate. Rebuke is the starting point of the penalty mechanism. If it is found by the police upon further investigation that other actions are required, criminal or disciplinary investigations and procedures will be undertaken. And the police will handle such cases in accordance with the established mechanism in a fair and impartial manner. Regarding the aforementioned 22 cases in which police officers were rebuked, the police have undertaken disciplinary review for four of them. While the complaints against police officer Capo has received complaints regarding 19 of them. Given that the procedures of Capo and the disciplinary review procedures of the police are underway, it is not appropriate for me to comment on the details of the cases. The police do not maintain the breakdown of statistics in relation to rebuke as requested in the question. Regarding the promotion of officers, the police will consider the overall performance of officers in appraisal and the selection including job performance, abilities and discipline, etc. As for salaries, the police will consider whether an officer should be given an increment in accordance with the relevant regulations of the Civil Service Bureau. Only officers whose performance, including 
conduct, attitude, and efficiency is considered satisfactory upon due appraisal will be recommended to be given an increment. 3. There is a need for media practitioners to undertake reporting duties and the police have a duty to adopt measures to safeguard public safety and public order. In particular, this duty is a statutory one which the police must discharge. During operations and where circumstances permit, the police will strive to complement the work of the media on the basis of mutual understanding and respect so that both sides can perform their respective functions. During operations over the past months, the police have from time to time encountered instances of reporter impersonalization, including fake reporter identification being seized, self-proclaimed reporters found to be not employed by the media organization they claimed, people wearing outfits similar to those of reporters, and immediate departure upon being questioned about, about reporter credentials. In the past, Persons suspected of impersonating reporters engaged in acts inconsistent with the duties of reporters and even attempted to obstruct police enforcement, participate in illegal and violent acts, and even to commit the serious offence of snatching suspects from police officers. The government believes that professional and bona fide reporters engaged in media work would not engage in illegal acts or intentionally obstruct police enforcement while covering events. The police, where operations are not affected, have been facilitating reporters as far as possible. The police have always reminded reporters that they should also pay attention to police instructions and maintain appropriate distance with the police so as to ensure safety of both sides. The police are a professional team and attach great importance to discipline and conduct. The behaviors of individual officers are subject to a rigorous disciplinary and administrative regime. Officers have their own personal responsibility and are responsible to the police. If anyone has any complaint against police officers, CAPO will handle such in a fair and impartial manner. While the Independent Police Complaints Council, or IPCC, will exercise independent and serious monitoring. To enhance communication and explore how to foster mutual understanding and respect of policing and reporting work, the Commission of Police has invited media organisations for a meeting this week. As I understand, the meeting will take place tomorrow. The IPCC has also made two recommendations in its report released last week on the matter. That is one, review how to facilitate the work of reporters in major operations without causing undue hindrance to the police's enforcement actions. And two, review the need for engaging media representatives to draw up a code of practice allowing the police and media to fulfill their respective duties and for ensuring the safety of all concerned. The Security Bureau will set up a task force to follow up and I will personally supervise. I believe that the media and the police will look for a consensus on the basis of mutual respect and understanding, which will be beneficial to the work of both sides. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Andrew Wen. Mr. President, Secretary John Lee just told blatant lies at the latter part of his answer. He put up excuses such as snatching suspects from police officers and fake reporters and did not try to uh, explain the evil acts of police officers. He just put up a brave face and repeated the same answers in this council time and again. Let me give you these examples. This one on the left hand side, this is the victim whose head was bashed unreasonably by the police officers with a baton last July. And this one is uh, 21st of March when I was exercising my duty in Yunlong. Some police officers just sprayed pepper spray at me, and uh, that was the state I was in. They just turned away without saying uh, what law I uh, broke. And this reporter also had the head bashed, similar to what happened two weeks ago on Mother's Day in the ladies' toilet. The female reporter was assaulted by the police. That's because 
police um, reporters found male police officers in ladies' toilet. So we have ironclad evidence, Secretary for Security. Are you going to turn a blind eye to the police brutality and abuse of power? Because we have blatant examples of police officers hurting the citizens of Hong Kong. They are exercising excessive force. They are blatantly breaching the law. Are you going to sell out your soul and be so evil evil as to allow police to abuse his power in such a manner? Well, it is the honorable member who is selling out his uh, conscience. He just cherry-picked some examples. If he could just file a complaint, these complaints could be dealt with in a fair and impartial manner. Intermittently, there were instances as shown in footages that really don't tally with the whole course of events. Now, from what I watched, there were objects hurled at police officers, and police officers put up shields to protect members of the public so that they could escort them to leave. But according to other media reports, this was described as police officers driving away members of the public. In order to have fairness and impartiality, you should lodge a complaint. Just like the story you just narrated, you should file a complaint so that we can have impartial and fair investigation. And the member just made a very serious allegation. I must make myself clear. Everything I said is based on facts. We believe professional and bona fide reporters engage in genuine media work. But let me give you some examples. This is the truth. Last year, in August, the Journalist Association found a reporter uh, identification card belonging to a media, media organization in Macau, and that was later verified as a fake one. And there was also a YouTuber from Canada telling us that he bought a reflexive vest together with reporter credentials in Hong Kong. And then he also testified the violence exercised by rioters. And also, in another incident in Lantau Island, the police intercepted a person with reflexive vest and uh, rep a fake reporter identification. He claimed himself to be a reporter. In another case, a person was found to be in possession of a bomb. And this person was, at the time of arrest, wearing a reflexive vest. And also in Shatin Town Plaza, on, in fact, this is shown on the TV. The person was a fake reporter wearing reflective vest. That's why we agree that there should be a meeting between the police and the media so that they could forge consensus for both of them to fulfill their respective duties. For individual police officers, if their conduct is in breach of any disciplinary regulations, then a police complaint should be filed and CAPO will handle these cases and they will be accountable in such a manner so that we can have fairness and impartiality. Yes, your question has been answered. I need to clarify, first of all, Mr. President, that I made a report to the police. You don't need to clarify that. No, because he said I didn't. I made a report to the police, but the... It, it just left dangling here. This is not a debate. Please sit down. Please put your question. Let us know which part of your question hasn't been answered. It's not for you to elucidate any fact. The speaker is not coming through. Mr. Andrew Wen, you uttered a lot of words. Just tell me which part of the question hasn't been answered. We have concrete evidence. Are you going to look into that? Is there going to be any investigation? I made a report to the comp uh, to the police. We welcome any report made to the police. Definitely, we will launch an investigation. But the most important thing is to use your genuine identity when you make a report, because sometimes some victims may make allegations in front of the media without filing a proper report. Mr. Jeffrey Lam, Mr. President. As we always hear, the opposition camp tends to say police brutality without laying out facts about brutality exercised by 
or violence exercised by the rioters as well. Sometimes they cherry pick footages to exaggerate some police officers losing control and losing temper. They are putting the cart before the horse and confusing the logic. This is not beneficial to our society. There must be a cause to any consequence. We witness how rioters hold petrol bombs and vandalize public properties. Mr. Jeffrey Lamb, please put your question. That is why the police officers are here to maintain law and order and rigorously enforcing the law. Now, has the secretary got an understanding about the real reason of some police officers losing control and losing temper when handling public events? And have you taken fully into account the, the circumstantial factors, including violence of rioters, in considering uh, rebuking the relevant police officers and whether their promotion prospects will be affected? Secretary, when handling public order events, major rallies, in particular violent acts, Police officers have been abiding the relevant guidelines and codes and laws of Hong Kong in their actions. There may be individual police officers whose performance is not up to satisfaction by a member of the public. Then as long as there is a complaint, we'll look into that. On action taken on police officers, rebuke is a form of administrative measure. As I explained just now, the police commissioner is of the view that this administrative measure can have immediate intervention and rectification. The relevant police officer will also know as soon as possible the act to be rectified. I strongly welcome this approach. It is just a starting point of the penalty mechanism. The police will continue to follow up on the matter as appropriate. And if um, the there is a disciplinary problem, the procedures for disciplinary action will be taken and everything will be dealt with according to the law. Over the years, Officers' discipline have been regulated in accordance with the police discipline regulations. And the it is an overall uh, disciplinary mechanism, including minor offense and also uh, serious or criminal offenses. For the police commissioner to take administrative measure t for early intervention, this is an improvement to the existing mechanism, Mr. James Toe. The government and the pro-establishment camp members may be uh, harping the old tunes, uh, citing uh, violence by rioters, etc. Let's take a look at the public opinion polls. The police force has got uh, the lowest popularity rating ever. Over 50% of respondents gave a zero mark to the police. In fact, half a year ago, I asked police officers, I mean, I asked the police whether any single police officer had been punished under the disciplinary mechanism. When we had a police sergeant riding a motorcycle and ramming it into the crowd, the secretary said that this is just the start of the penalty mechanism and the sergeant would be rebuked, and that's all. How could people have any trust in the police and the government? How could the uh, the public believe that they are treated fairly, Secretary? I just heard the members' words, and I think this is exactly why some members of the public would believe this version as the truth. The police have always attach great importance to discipline. He seemed to suggest that the police will not take action against any offending officers. This is untrue. 
In fact, as I said in the reply, those police officers breaching disciplinary regulations and uh, even uh, the law will be punished. We do have statistics, and it is untrue that they will be uh, left uh, to go scot-free. You're misleading the public, and I need to clarify and I need to give some very strong warning that this is not true. In the light of recent events, the police commissioner, on his, his own initiative, set up an integrity review unit, a task force on integrity uh, checks. So he will be looking into any breach of disciplinary regulations, and he will also identify areas for improvements. And third, he will also supervise matters relating to conduct and discipline. I would say that the force rigorously abides by the disciplinary regulations. I would urge members of the public not to be misled by these biased remarks. Yes, point of order, Mr. Stephen Ho. In question number three, there are remarks that can constitute discrimination. I asked for a ruling by the uh, by the president because if this is tabled into the council, this will form part of uh, our record, and we should not uh, we should clarify the matter. We should not call this a disease in such a manner. Now the question is from members. As long as the question is not against the rules of procedure, I will respect the member and approve the raising of the question. I noted that. Uh, Dr. Kwok mentioned the name of the virus as uh, in, in terms of a common uh, description, and I regard that as a supplementary description. Now, I remind you that the WHO has formally named the virus as COVID-19. This is the professional uh, description. Members should use that description as much as possible to avoid unnecessary dissent. Uh, Dr. Kwokaki, I'd like to add, now that Abicho mentions that this involves discrimination, so I hope that the Secretariat uh, in LegCo Commission should have a discussion on uh, regulating the use of these terms. Otherwise, when I call a member by a certain name and I add a common description, would that be permitted? I already explained. I consider that the question is in accordance with the procedural rules. Of course, if the members use a uh, rather negative or uh, depreciating term, uh, I would make alternative decision. Uh, when Dr. Kwok issued this question, the Secretariat has vetted it carefully before I give consent. Chairman Pan, Chairman, I believe that if we do not take correct action on a term, it will leave many problems. If one adds a common description and you can use an, an insulting term, I don't think that's appropriate. In the future, in our questions, if we mention Kokaki, uh, if we use very derogatory terms, would that be permitted? I don't think so. Chairman, you should make ruling when inappropriate language is used. The secretary should not allow it. It should be cut. Otherwise, there would be a variety of descriptions. As I explained, we went through the Secretariat and followed our past rules of procedure. Dr. Kwok? Ho Chen Yan. Albert Ho, please. Do not uh, be uh, vindictive against the Secretariat. Dr. Kwok, uh, please uh, be conscientious in your question. Dr. Kwok, it's now time for you to answer a question. Since January this year, there have been successive confirmed cases of coronavirus 2019, commonly known as Wuhan pneumonia, 
imported into Hong Kong from the mainland. In February, several thousand members of healthcare personnel of the hospital authority went on strike for five consecutive days. The authorities imposed a ban on the entries of all visitors to Hong Kong, while the mainland adopt measures to reduce the risk of infection, including ensuring adequate supply of face masks. Moreover, it has been reported that due to the tight supply of personal protective equipment or PPE, some healthcare personnel are requested to reuse their isolation gowns or temporarily keep their used face masks and paper bags for reuse. The HA has also repeatedly lowered the requirements stipulated in the infection control guidelines on the protection protection specifications of PBE that should be used by healthcare personnel when conducting various medical procedures. Regarding the HA's tackling of the epidemic and related matters, will the government inform this council? One, whether it has assessed if HA has contravened Article 27 of the Basic Law, which stipulates that the Hong Kong residents shall have the right and freedom to strike etc. by issuing letters to the staff members who participated in the strike asking them to explain the reasons for their absence from duty. If it has assessed and the outcome of the affirmative, how the government will follow the matter to safeguard their rights to strike. 2. Whether it knows the ranks of the officers who made the decisions to repeatedly lower the requirements of the protective specifications of PPE and the justification therefore. And three, whether it knows the quantities of the various types of PPE currently kept by HA and the numbers of days for which the stock can last. The details about HA's procurement of each type of PPE since the epidemic outbreak, including the method, quantity, place of origin, and amount of expenditure. Whether the government has supplied to HA or assisted HA in the procurement of the relevant PBE, if so, of the details. Secretary for Food and Health. Okay. President, since the outbreak of the novel coronavirus infection, the government has been closely monitoring the development of the situation and responding comprehensively with decisive and appropriate measures. In accordance with the government's prevention and control strategies, we have introduced specific measures in the areas of health surveillance, compulsory quarantine, isolation treatment, health declaration, exit screening, reducing cross-boundary flow of post people, enhancing social distancing, lo local supporting various types of frontline staff and provision of protective equipment for the community. We are very thankful uh, for the unfailing contributions from healthcare and frontline staff and will continue to give priority to meeting their needs for protecting equipment, etc. In consultation with the hospital authority, and Financial Services and the Treasury Bureau, my reply to the various parts of the question raised by Dr. Kwok is as follows. Chairman, I'd like to clarify that our reply is in keeping with the term COVID-19. The government and DHA always take safeguarding the health of the public and protection of Hong Kong healthcare system as the top priority. In response to the industrial action from 3rd to 7th February, which affected public hospital services, the HA activated the major incident control center to closely monitor the operation of public hospitals and to deploy manpower and adjust uh, non-emergency services with regard to service needs with a view of focusing resources on dealing with the epidemic and maintaining emergency medical services. The government and HA also repeatedly urged the uh, healthcare staff participating in the industry action to return to work to as soon as possible to avoid affecting the public. The HA noted that around 7,000 staff had not reported for duty as scheduled on various dates during the above period. The HA will gather information from the staff concerned on the individual circumstances and consider the follow-up actions in each case in accordance with the HA's human resources policies and the employment ordinance, CAP 57. 2. The HA has been following international guidelines and expert advice in providing healthcare personnel with stringent infection control guidelines and training in order to safeguard them from infection at work. 
The Central Committee on Infectious Disease and Emergency Response, or CCIDER, of DHA is responsible for providing strategic advice on the management of infectious diseases, infection control, and outbreak contingency plans. It also con convenes meetings in response to international and local situations of infectious disease so as to coordinate the various measures. Its membership include representatives from the Center for Health Protection of the Department of Health, coordinating committees and central committees of relevant specialties and head office of the HA as well as HA's experts on infectious control and infectious diseases. The HA has been closely monitoring the latest situation of the coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 and making reference to international guidelines including those issued by the WHO and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the United States. Since the HA had limited knowledge about the pathogen characteristics and mode of transmission of the normal coronavirus at the outset of the Onset of the outbreak, personal protective equipment of higher specific specifications was used in order to prevent airborne transmission. However, as the outbreak developed, the international community has gained a better understanding of the virus and confirmed that the pathogen SARS coronavirus 2 is mainly transmitted through contacts and droplets. The, so the CCIDER, uh, having hence revised its uh, recommendations on PBE for the HA after making reference to the latest international recommendations, clinical ev evidence in literature and local clinical experiences and having regard to the global supply of PPE. As of 15th May, the PPE stockpile of public hospitals includes approximately uh, 27 million surgical masks, 3.6 million protective gowns, 5.7 million face shields, face shields and 2.3 million N95 respirators. At the current usage rate, the stockpile of various protective equipment is sufficient for use for around more than two months. Following the swine flu pandemic in 2009, the HA reviewed its stockpile of protective equipment by making reference to the depletion of protective equipment during the pandemic period as well as relevant information available from WHO. The HA stockpile of PPE has increased from 42 days to 90 days since then with a view to building sufficient emergency stock. With the development of the COVID-19 outbreak, the HA has expedited the procurement of PPE in large quantities since January 2020 and increased the stockpiling target to six months. In addition, the HA proceeded with global procurement in late, in late January through the flexible approach of direct purchase with a view to procuring the appropriate protective equipment as soon as possible. The Government Logistics Department has also shared information with HA and provided with facilitation to assist it in procuring the necessary equipment. With the government assistance, the, pro the pro equipment ordered earlier by the HA has arrived in Hong Kong gradually. The government will continue to closely liaise with the HA and make the best effort to ensure that adequate protective equipment will be provided to healthcare staff for patient care. Dr. Kwok. Thank you, President. Now, uh, the, given the Wuhan uh, pneumonia, uh, the Hong Kong people have taken the initiative to wear face masks. The healthcare workers uh, sacrificed their frontiers to go on strike and asking the government to uh, keep a lid on new entrants into Hong Kong. I am very disappointed that the Secretary has not answered the most important points. The Article 27 of Basic Law says every member of the Hong Kong community has to be given, uh, has to be accorded the right to strike. You didn't answer that. You said that the HA senior management uh, used some uh, human relations regulations uh, to, uh, in order to. Uh, um, Keep, make the staff accountable later on. Now, this uh, shows the HA staff how they fought the Wuhan pneumonia. They uh, had to uh, share their protective counts. Uh, 14 uh, people, staff work, uh, work by 14 staff were reduced to being handled by two. Please keep to your question. Uh, uh, 
Article 27, please allow that to be answered. Now, I said that, uh, plastic bags were used. If asked your question, please sit down. The Secretary, please. Thank you, Chairman. Now, with the development of the epidemic, the HA has all along uh, followed closely uh, the WHO and the US CDC and local infection control uh, information and advice from experts uh, to determine uh, uh, the specifications for the PPE for the frontline staff. Now, with the increasing knowledge internationally about the epidemic, these guidelines have been gradually adjusted and the HA has followed. Now, the HA shared information with the staff and in providing the protective gear where conditions permit for storage, the staff have been assured. We understand that the staff will protect the public. You have asked two questions already. Please sit down. If you need to ask quest further questions, you have to press the button again. Wong Kok King. President, in the original question, uh, there was the inappropriate term, uh, Wuhan pneumonia. I believe it should not appear formally in, in the formal legal document. I asked the President to make a ruling. First, looking at the whole question. The Wu mention of Wuhan pneumonia doesn't increase the public's understanding of the question, so it's not necessary, not essential. It is a derogatory term for no good reason, and the HWHA just held recently asked the individual countries to adopt appropriate measures to prevent the uh, disease from being employed in derogation. In, now, we are uh, a formal legislature. Uh, the use of this term uh, please make a ruling on whether it's appropriate. President, you are raising a rule of procedure. He's raising a rule of procedure. I have to li listen to it. Now, people have raised the point that in rules of procedure, there is no formal regulation of such terms. But the ROP didn't say what terms can be employed. So, the LegCo ROP has not specified the appropriate usage, so you can make a ruling according to ROP 92. Please make a ruling, Dr. Kwok. Chairman, uh, Mr. Wong Kwok Kin's question is unrelated to the question. Please raise your rules of procedure question. Oh, procedure question. Now, a lot of time is wasted. We cannot uh, uh, uh. Now, now, two members uh, um, made uh, this point about the uh, 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 point of order. Now, uh, uh, about the... Uh, now, as president, I have to be careful in uh, now as long as uh, the point, points of order are followed, I will try to be tolerant and let them air their views. And this question was not made yesterday. Because for many weeks, we haven't dealt with these questions. 
So this went to the government. Now, on whether we respect our country or the WHO, uh, it's up to the individual member. Dr. Joseph Lee. Now, the point of the question is that we asked the government on prevention of uh, fighting the epidemic, whether the government did a proper job in provo protecting the healthcare workers. Now, now uh, a lot of members uh, did not exercise the supervision on the government. My question is simple. The secretary uttered the answer, but Dr. Kwok's question is direct. On part two, did you lower the standards of control? Now, in February, the HA's guidelines were that uh, patients will have two surgical masks per person, uh, frontline staff for each, and as of May this year, patient one mask, and frontline staff surgical mask one to two per day. So this is a downward adjustment. That's for N95 re respirator. There are 2.3 million in the answer. But the frontline staff tell us that for different models, now some of them don't fit. They, there's no fit test done in many cases. And you say you have done many things, but the frontline staff don't feel being protected. Now the government says it's asking the HA to uh, reopen some non-emergency services. Maybe you can allow visits. Now, you have two months of PPE, uh, surgical masks. So you are using those masks for that reopening or for the protection of healthcare workers. Now, the HA for the sake of transparency and openness, they uh, provide figures on usage and stockpile. It's enough for two months. Now, for the frontline staff, I have asked the HA. They inform me that there is no definite figure. Now, each staff member or each ward uh, has its own control measures and needs of the ward, uh, and the protective gear are protect provided to the staff accordingly. Uh, when they need to, they can make the request, and the HA will supply the equipment or gear. So the HA uh, has always tried to protect its staff. Now. Uh, Dr. Lee mentioned N95 respirators. Now, this is in shortage supply throughout the world. As we know, uh, different parts of the world, uh, they uh, are suffering uh, volatile uh, situations in the COVID-19, and there's a shortage worldwide. So we are trying to procure around the world, from around the world, and we also uh, try to procure locally uh, uh, various uh, advanced uh, respirators uh, from locally or around the world. Now, uh, the uh, logistics uh, and the supply of materials are in very tight uh, supply situation, uh, so they have to keep a careful control on materials and equipment, and they also have to try to increase the stockpile. Uh, but at the same time, they will provide adequate protection for frontline healthcare workers. And in internal communications, uh, they inform the staff of the stockpiles of PPE and the strategies concerned. And there is hotline uh, for frontline workers uh, to address the questions to Dr. Shu Kachun. What question has not been answered? You try to make up a stockpile of two months, so you restrict them uh, in their usage. As I already mentioned, 
The stockpile is a transparent piece of information for everyone at the front line. If they need to use PPE, DHA, and in the future, now and in the future, will supply adequate PPE to the staff for the protection. Xu Kanchun. The main answer of the secretary reminds me of words by uh, Mr. Mandela of South Af Africa. It was a wrong quotation. Now, Dr. Kwok said that uh, frontline staff were asked to reuse uh, face masks and uh, gowns. The government uh, didn't reply directly, and it says that uh, it takes into account uh, international practice and local uh, clinical practice. Can we be told which piece of international literature is relied upon? Now, has the uh, secretary, uh, in fact, uh, been derogatory in such quoting? As I said, the WHO and the US CDC in the proposals on use of PPE, uh, they, that has been a source of reference for the HA. So uh, in the course of that, they have pro issued different guidelines. And as I mentioned, the HA has also internal mechanism on infection control. Uh, they hold meetings with experts and they decide what uh, PPE would be used in what types of procedures and which, in which wards. Now, as for PPE being reused, the, I've asked this uh, the HA about this. Uh, now, the HA informed me that uh, they use uh, the uh, surgical mask or uh, N95 uh, during the day, but if they start another procedure, they are free to use uh, new ones. Question four. Dr. Fernando Chang. Mr. President, in recent months, the police have placed a large number of mules barriers on certain footpaths and fenced off government buildings with huge water barriers. Some wheelchair users and visually impaired persons have complained to me, alleging that such objects have caused inconvenience to them, including passageways leading to lifts being obstructed, tactile guide paths being broken up, and iron gates of the water barrier enclosures being too narrow for wheelchairs to pass. In this connection, will the government inform this council first? whether the police have formulated guidelines stipulating that impacts on the use of barrier-free access facilities by persons with disabilities PWDs, should be avoided when their faucet objects are placed on footpaths. If so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Second, whether while PWDs are participating in public events or traveling, channels are available for them to seek immediate assistance when their access is obstructed by the objects placed by the police. If so, of the details, if not, whether such channels will be established. And third, whether the police will immediately examine the impacts of their placing the aforesaid objects on the travelling of PWDs and remove such objects as early as possible. If so, of the details, if not, the reasons for that. Ms. Secretary for Security. Mr. President, Members of the public may conduct assemblies and processions and express their views, but they must do so in a lawful, peaceful and orderly manner and should respect other people's rights. Regarding barrier-free facilities, 
the government has formulated policies and objectives to provide a barrier-free environment for persons with disabilities (PWDs), with a view to enabling them to access premises and make use of community facilities and services on an equal basis with others, thereby helping them live independently, fully take part in various social activities, and integrate into the community. All government departments have access coordinators and access officers who coordinate efforts in enhancing the accessibility of government premises and facilities under their purview. All government departments, including the police, follow these policies and objectives. There is no need for the police to formulate their own policies and objectives. The police all along handle all public order events, POEs, in a fair, just and impartial manner in accordance with the laws of Hong Kong. It has been the established policy of the police to endeavour to strike a balance between facilitating the smooth conduct of lawful and peaceful public meetings and processions on the one hand, while on the other, minimising the impact of such events on members of the public and road users, as well as maintaining public safety and public order. Order. During the demonstrations over the past few months, the police remained steadfast in discharging their duties and handled the provocations of demonstrators with tolerance and restraint. However, not only were the police not being informed of some protests in advance in accordance with the law, people participating in the protests conducted unlawful assemblies in various places, many of which ended up in violence. The escalating and frequent violence of rioters seriously threatens the lives and properties of the public. The police have a statutory duty to maintain law, public order and public safety. In situations where public order and public safety are seriously threatened, the police must take actions decisively to curb violence and restore public peace. A consolidated reply to the three parts of the member's question is provided below. Since June last year, there have been over 1,400 demonstrations, processions and public meetings in Hong Kong many of which developed into serious breach of law and violent incidents. Every now and then during that period, rioters advocated besieging, blocking and vandalizing the central government offices, the legislative council complex, police stations in various districts, disciplined services quarters and other buildings. These acts have seriously affected the work and life of people using the above premises, including the emergency services provided to the public by the police. Moreover, some rioters threw petrol bombs at police stations and government properties, set fires, attacked police vehicles and police stations, hurled objects and sprayed graffiti at the police headquarters, as well as vandalized government facilities, posing serious threat to public safety and public order. After risk assessment, in order to protect these buildings, the police considered it necessary to enhance the security thereof. Apart from deploying officers to station at these buildings, a number of measures have been implemented to prevent attacks and damage, including setting up water barriers. When the police take relevant security measures, they will communicate with the responsible persons of the property management of the premises consent. This is to ensure the effective implementation of the security measures on the one hand and minimize the impact on people using these premises and road users, including PWDs, on the other. When security measures are put into effect, the police will maintain contact with the responsible persons of the property management consent for reviewing the security measures and arrangements from time to time. The police have contacted different stakeholders, including non-governmental organizations offering support to PWDs and explained to them the reasons for implementing security measures by the police. Meanwhile, the police have also explained to them the government's barrier-free policy for access to government venues or use of relevant facilities therein. PWDs may directly seek help from the access officer responsible for the accessibility issues of the relevant government venues if necessary. I need to point out that the use of water barriers and implementation of additional security measures in these government buildings were necessary. 
countermeasures taken in response to the frequent violence and attack incidents that took place in some government premises which provided services to the public and police stations over the past few months. If members of the public conduct POEs in a peaceful, lawful and orderly manner and do not commit serious violent acts of vandalism and attacks, such as those we saw on the television, there will be no need for the, gov uh, the police to implement the above security measures. I hope the public will address the serious damage and undesirable impacts of the riotous violence on our society. Since June last year, a large number of shops and even courts, including the Court of Final Appeal, the High Court and the Magistrates' Courts, have been vandalized. About 740 sets of traffic lights across the city have been intentionally vandalized more than 1,600 times, which include cutting of wires, defacing or even burning down. Besides, as at the 11th of March 2020, the barrier free facilities, including escalators and lifts of the MTRCL, have been vandalized about 120 times and over 80 times, respectively. These violent acts of vandalism of the rioters have severely affected the daily lives and access of people from all walks of life, including PWDs, causing inconvenience or even danger to all commuters. If members care about the accessibility of PWDs, they should care about protecting the facilities for PWDs and should vehemently condemn the violent acts of rioters that destroyed the facilities for PWDs. The public should firmly reject the violence of the rioters. Moreover, members should not acquiesce or to or glorify violent acts of the rioters and not become accomplices in destroying the tranquility of our society. Thank you, President. Dr. Fernando Chang, Kerry Lam's administration took the lead to destroy the tranquility of our society because they would like to run through the anti-extradition bill um, and it had the police not used uh, violence against the peaceful protesters. We don't have what we got. Now, I'm trying to be polite and I try to ask why we are having such um, facilities blocking the access of the PWDs. I'm showing you one of the lifts of the city tower. When you open, when the doors are open, then we have the uh, water barriers blocking the door of the doorway. I have an assistant uh, who uses a wheelchair. Every day he has been affected by such obstacles. There are also others who are visually impaired and likewise they have been affected. Now I try to ask whether you are going to remove them. Don't you think there should be some guidelines for the placement of such um, obstacles? Can we get any uh, instant help if the access is uh, blocked? I try to get an answer and he hasn't. Secretary, I give an answer in great details. We do have access coordinators and access officers. If anybody needs help, they can turn to the coordinators and officers called responsible for accessibility. Such information is available to the public on the website of the Labour and Welfare Bureau. Now, for each and every uh, government building, the information about the access coordinators and access officers uh, is open and uh, is publicly available. Now, if somebody is really concerned about the um, barrier-free environment for the PWDs, if you really care for the need on the part of PWDs to use facilities, then perhaps we should look at the root cause as to why they have been denied of such facilities and why we need to um, safeguard the public safety in our city. It's all because the rioters have destroyed the facilities. In fact, it's not just my uh, own assertion. Well, in fact, uh, there is a comment from the society from a society for the blind. They have fought for a few years, many years, to get the barrier-free facilities at the MTR stations. Uh, 
they would like to benefit from such facilities so that the visually impaired can move around freely. I don't think we should condone the damage of such facilities. We need to set them um, matter uh, right. And the rich cause uh, is violence. And the EOC has also said that if you ignore the basic needs of the PWDs, then it is not right, and it's all because of the vandalism. And then for the PWDs in their daily lives, they have been affected. We must not allow the facilities to be damaged to endanger the PWDs when they commute. So we have to look at the root cause of the problem. What resulted in the damage to the um, very free facilities, why we had to step up the security. It's all because of the rioters. If not for the rioters, there's no need for us to worry about um, attacks anytime, anywhere. Well, let's recall what happened last year or the days in the past. In the past, we used to be able to lead a peaceful life and uh, we could uh, have a normal um, so we can. We hope we can return to the normal. No, it's not about damaging the facilities. It, here it shows that it hasn't been damaged. The lift itself is in good order, but then um, the the you have obstructed. You have obstructed the access because the doorway has been blocked. We need to look at the cause and the outcome. Well, the cause is violence. I was citing examples to show that um, as a result of the violence, many facilities for the PWDs have been damaged. There is a need to step up the security. And you can see the cause and effect um, relationship. We, were, uh, we had to deploy such facilities. Dr. K.K. Kuo, shame on you, John D. It's you and Kerry Lamb who try to force through the Fugitive Offenders Amendment Bill. Fernando Zheng, our colleague, tried to ask you a question about the facilities for the PWDs. I had expected all the um, directors of bureaus to answer the question, say, for example, Professor Law, but surprisingly, it's, the John, it's John Lee. We just asked a question about PWD's facilities, and yet the Security Bureau is taking up this question. Everything is to be decided by the police, even for the barrier-free facilities for the PWD's. They have a say. Dr. K.K. Kwok, your question. Are you telling everybody in Hong Kong that John Lee and the Black Corps are to rule Hong Kong? Others can't have a say. You have a free hand to place the water barriers in whatever way you like and anywhere you like. Secretary, well, I think it's shame on him because he ignored the facts. He would just talk about his self-interest and he would only hold firm his own position, ignoring facts. There's no need for me to answer his question. Sorry, Speaker, it's off mic. Please sit down. Secretary, anything to add? First of all, President, I don't think I can agree with him to describe the police in this way. I haven't used the same uh, description of members. I don't think he should um, focus on uh, airing personal attacks on against others. Mr. Michael Look. Fernando Zheng and other lawmakers are condoning violence. They are hypocritic. They play victim. For the past year, they have been glorifying and condoning street violence. The LC complex was damaged when they stormed into the complex, and that's why we need to place so many water barriers. Yes, I know it is inconvenient. It is inconvenient for the PWDs. Fernando Zheng, I think you yourself admitted that you would like to have the I burn, you burn with us policy. I think you are halfway. Um, successful in your in your target. Now, Secretary, many PWDs told me that for the sun emitting component of the traffic lights, 
As a result of the damage carried out by the rioters, they haven't been sort of uh, um, restored. So for the visually impaired, they find it very inconvenient and it is dangerous because the traffic lights no longer uh, emit a warning sound. I want to know how many of them are still uh, waiting for repair. And is there a way for us to claim damages from or compensation from the rioters and those who condone such acts? Secretary, I haven't got the information with me. I will provide the information afterwards. I agree that for some emitting uh, devices to help the PWDs to cross the road have been damaged, and as a result, they have been much inconvenienced. For such damage, we, when we arrest those uh, who should be held liable, will go after their liability, not just criminally, but also um, their civic liabilities as well. In the past, say for example, when MGR facilities were vandalized, the offenders who have been convicted were also ruled by the court to bear criminal responsibility as well as uh, paying compensation to the MTRCL. My understanding is that it's a sum of $140,000 involving two defendants. So in similar cases, if we have got the evidence, we'll go after those who are responsible for such acts, both criminally and in terms of uh, civil um, action. Well, just now, uh, John Lee has cited the comments of the Society for the Blind. Uh, I think uh, it was, they also said that um, the uh, visually impaired had been stopped by the police, and the police even wondered and challenged whether their uh, walking stick uh, could be regarded as a uh, weapon, or the cane can be regarded as a um, offensive weapon. I want to know whether you have a guideline to say for how long the water barriers will be placed there. What about the access uh, coordinators and the access officers? Will they take the initiative to find out uh, for how long the water barriers will be uh, left there? Secretary, President, I made it clear in my answer. We are talking about additional security facilities. If there's no violence, then there's no need for additional security facilities. So my short reply is we should stand united to ask for a stop to the violence, and then there is no longer any need for such facilities. And then for the access coordinators and access officers, um, their information uh, is available to the public on the website of the Labor and Welfare Bureau as well as the website of the relevant departments. You can just go to the relevant websites to look up the information. When there is a request for assistance, uh, the coordinators and the officers uh, will handle the request. It won't just be about the police. Any government building, whether it is uh, a matter with the water barriers. As long as you have a request, you can turn to the coordinators um, for um, assistance or you can lodge a complaint, and the coordinators must and will handle the request. The police do take the initiative to talk to the NGOs, like um, we have the um, we have approached NGOs uh, taking care of the interests of the PWDs as well as the blind, and we have uh, elaborated to them um, the reasons as to why at certain locations we need to come up with um, extra and special security measures. We have also talked about the channels to seek assistance. We have also provided the information 
that would be necessary. Say, for example, web page, website, as well as the names and contact details of those uh, officers involved. Um, the links would be and have been provided. So we have the efforts uh, being put into uh, the matter so as to ensure the access of the officially uh, impaired. And we try to j explain why the police have to do so. Thank you. Question five, Mr. Felix Chong. President, before I ask the question, I declare that um, I supply face masks to prevent COVID-19 Healthcare personnel and members of the public have to always wear masks. Some environmentalists pointed out that a large number of face masks are disposed of improperly every day, raising risks of spreading the virus and also environmental pollution. In this collection, connection, will the government inform this council one whether the Environment Bureau has compiled statistics on or estimated the accumulated and average quantities of face masks disposed every day across the territory since the outbreak? And two, as some environmentalists pointed out that antiviral N95 masks and surgical masks generally contain non-degradable materials. And since a large number of face masks are discarded along with domestic waste in landfills every day, whether ENB has assessed the impacts of such a situation on the environment and ecology. And three, of the measures adopted by ENB to handle the pollution Cost to the environment and ecology by discarded face masks. Secretary for the Environment. President, since the outbreak started, we do not keep statistics on the number of face masks used by Hong Kong people. However, with an estimated population of 7.5 million and a labor force of about 4 million, the amounts of disposable face masks used daily could be in the order of millions. Based on the estimation that around 4 to 6 million face masks are used in Hong Kong every day, and each face mask weighs about 2 to 3 grams, the face masks disposed at landfills every day will weigh some 10 to 15 tons. According to the report on monitoring of solid waste in Hong Kong, waste statistics for 2018, the amount of municipal solid waste disposed at landfills was 11.4 thousand tons per day. On this basis, it's estimated that disposable face masks discarded during the epidemic will account for about 0.1% of the MSW disposed of at landfills. Disposable face masks are mainly made of plastics, such as non-woven fabrics, filter layers, and elastic strings, etc., and waste plastics is the third largest constituent of MSW in Hong Kong. According to the 2018 report mentioned above, the amount of waste plastics disposed at landfills was about 2,300 TPD. On this basis, it's estimated that disposable face masks discarded during the epidemic will account for about 0.5% of the waste plastics disposed. Since disposable masks, including N95 masks and surgical masks, are made of composite materials of different plastics and metals which are difficult to be separated, they are not suitable for recycling or discarded in recycling bins to avoid contamination. In addition, the government announced on the 5th of May that it would distribute reusable masks to Hong Kong citizens, which can help reduce the use of disposable face masks. Presently, discarded face masks from hospitals and isolation centers handling suspected and confirmed cases will be disposed of as clinical waste by delivery to the chemical waste treatment center for incineration at a high temperature of about 1,000 degrees Celsius. All the emissions will be treated by advanced air pollution control equipment to ensure compliance with stringent emission standards to protect the environment. As for face masks used by the public, they will mainly be collected along with domestic waste by refuse collection vehicles and sent to landfills directly or through refuse transfer stations. In the transfer station, the waste will be conveyed to the purpose-built seal type containers via automated conveyance system and then transport by sea or road to the landfill for disposal. The process of waste handling at the transfer station is mainly operated by machinery and staff do not need to contact or handle the waste with their hands. The contractor of the station will regularly 
clean the waste tipping hall, the floor, the waste conveyor system, and the waste containers and trucks to keep the place clean and hygienic. Waste water generated from the stations will be properly treated before discharging into public sewers and subsequently transported to the government sewer treatment works for further treatment. The landfill is designed and constructed as an enclosed containment incorporating multi-layer composite liner system covering the entire area of the site and leachate would be collected and properly treated. At the end of the daily operation, the contractor will cover the tipping areas with a layer of approximately 150 millimeters of soil and a cement-based cover material to ensure hygiene and prevent emission of odor. In addition, the biogas produced in a landfill will be collected by the gas collection station or system for the generation of energy. Under the enclosed envir environment in landfill, the domestic waste will decompose and undergo anaerobic digestion. Thermal energy will be generated and the temperature in the landfill will be increased, which will help kill pathogens including bacteria and viruses. E. coli is often used as a microbial indicator of pathogens. The lower its level, the less likely the pathogens would be present in the environment. We have taken leachate from landfill for testing of E. coli and re results show that there is no E. coli in the leachate. Therefore, the disposal of face masks in landfills would not result in the spreading of diseases. During the epidemic, relevant departments will step up their efforts in cleaning up discarded masks and refuse and remind their staff to stay vigilant, observe good personal hygiene and dispose of refuse properly. As members of the public visit country parks in recent days, relevant departments including the EPD and the AFCD have strengthened the publicity and taken follow-up action. For example, the AFCD deployed manpower flexibly to step up inspections and cleaning of venues. Meanwhile, the AFCD has also publicized through different channels including hanging banners and posting posters in country parks with high flow of visitors to urge them to maintain hygiene. FCD staff will also remind visitors to take away their own trash when patrolling the country trails. If littering is found, appropriate enforcement will be taken. In response to the novel coronavirus outbreak, the government has been reminding members of the public over the last few months through various media to maintain strict personal hygiene and appropriate social distance with others at all times and make proper use of personal protective equipment Used personal protective equipment should be discarded in littered rubbish bins and should not be littered elsewhere to avoid causing health risks and pollution to the nation. Thank you. Mr. Phoenix Chung. Thank you. There were recent reports that on average um, 200 million masks are uh, disposed of in Hong Kong every day, which comes to about 1 billion masks over five months. We don't know how long the pandemic will last, in the future, another 1 billion masks might be discarded. The secretary said the disposable masks will account for about 0.1% of the MSW, but um, this type of trash is different from trash such as, such as food waste. Many housing estates have placed dedicated masks or bins for face masks, which is a very good practice. Since these masks might carry bacteria or viruses, would you, would you arrange for dedicated bins for face masks? Very often um, street cleaners would um, stumble upon face masks on the streets and, um, and as such these cleaners are uh, vulnerable. How do you protect these cleaners? Can you place some dedicated face mask collection bins or stations? Secretary, thank you. In this regard, the government is doing all it can. At various government venues such as LCSD facilities or centers in country parks, there are internal guidelines in place to place 
littered rubbish bins near the entrance. And as such, um, people who need to discard their masks can do so um, at littered bins. And through um, collaboration with different departments, we encourage um, var various organizations to do the same, such as certain um, quasi public organizations like the Science Park. We are encouraging others to follow suit in order to minimize the health risk to frontline workers. Mr. Kent Lau. President, since the COVID-19 outbreak, the usage of masks has been going up and the number of discarded masks is also rising. We can see them, we can find them in masks, um, beaches, restaurants, etc. And this increases the risk of transmission. And this might become a loophole in our epidemic control work. Um, there ha have been sporadic confirmed cases in recent days, and we expect the pandemic to last for a while. The government should deal with the um, issue with discarded masks and minimize the risk of transmission. We should be more stringent in this regard. From what the Secretary said, the government is not actively exploring the setting up of face masks, recycling machines or bins like on the mainland. On the long run, they should develop um, smart face mask recycling machines with disinfection functions in order to avoid contamination. Would the government explore this idea? Thank you very much for the question. I believe we all agree that we should protect frontline workers from the risk of having to deal with discarded masks. At all government buildings, whether or not they are open to the public, there are internal guidelines in place. At, at the main entrances, there would be littered rubbish bins to collect discarded face masks. As to um, there's room for further improvement, we are happy to take in views of members. We would look at the um, examples from different parts of the world. On one hand, we would encourage the use of reusable masks, which would reduce the need for disposable masks. But having said that, um, disposable masks are still needed by certain groups or people. That is why um, we have set up littered rubbish bins at government venues. Mr. Kentlang, Secretary, in your reply, you have accommodated um, littered rubbish bins for discarded masks on the long run for the 200,000 strong civil service. Would you recommend or mandate the use of reusable masks? Secretary. In Hong Kong and other places, um, it remains a, a challenge to battle the pandemic. So in Hong Kong and other places, um, we have started to see um, the supply of different kinds of masks, including reusable masks. And this would help um, ease the demand or use of disposable masks. And um, this is about the um, trend in the society. Recently, the government developed a reusable mask for use by the public. So that would be an extra option. I think um, this is a direction that we can all agree on. We would step up publicity. Different people um, might use different masks. So um, 
the government's distribution of free masks is a good starting point, and we do that with the environment in mind. Mr. Felix Chong. There are lots of disposable masks in Hong Kong, even though reusable masks are available. The secretary said um, at all government facilities, littered rubbish bins have been placed. But um, everyone in Hong Kong wears a mask every day. If you only rely on these bins in government facilities, it is not enough. You should expand the face mask recycling equipment in all other places. You cannot just rely on the rubbish bins in government venues. How many discarded masks do you um, collect every day at these rubbish bins? I think it would be less than one in a million. Thank you. Different um, people uh, would have different um, habits in terms of using disposable masks. Many people would um, use a mask in a prudent manner. They might use a mask every day. When they get home from work, they might discard their mask. Let's say if there are few people in the family, then um, they would use a few masks every day. For rubbish bins at home, um, usually they are littered and very often litter bags would be used and this would be how they, this would be a typical way to discard their masks. For certain people, by the time they reach um, work, they would have to discard their masks because um, it is already soiled and they would discard their masks in the office or the workplace. That is why the government would encourage government and quasi governmental bodies to take heed of the suggestion by installing littered rubbish bins in the workplace That way, they can help build awareness among their staff on how best to deal with the discarded mass. At various government venues, we have installed littered rubbish bins as much as we can at the main entrances so that face masks can be discarded properly. Mr. Chong? It is not that hard to install recycling bins for face masks. The secretary said, uh, well, he talked about the habits of using face masks for different people. In summertime, face masks could be soiled easily. Or they can get wet. And um, people would often have to um, replace and discard their masks. So the government should introduce more such facilities to provide convenience to the public. We are looking at a lot of extra trash because some people would use some tissues or envelopes to um, wrap their face masks, which creates a lot of extra trash. If you install dedicated recycling bins for face masks um, near every rubbish bin. Is this really such a difficult job? I understand this view. Of course, um, there could be different scenarios. Very often, the supply of masks remain tight for many people. And many people would use one or two masks per day. And it's likely that um, many people would 
um, discard their mask at home or in the workplace. I think um, the point of uh, Mr. Chong is to encourage waste reduction at source and encourage the use of reusable masks. This should be something we support and this would deal with many problems. Last oral question, Dr. Priscilla Leung. President, while the government have been searching for the suitable premises for use as temporary quarantine facilities since the outbreak of the coronavirus disease 2019 epidemic in Hong Kong, it has encountered much difficulty. On the other hand, among the camps operated by NGOs, well, the question back in February, only Paul Leung Kok Chucky Club Pak Cham Chung Holiday Camp was earlier on use as a temporary quarantine facility. Regardless of the provision of quarantine facilities, will the government inform this council, one, of the respective numbers of quarantine residential places provided by previous and current quarantine facilities, and two, whether since the current outbreaks of the epidemic, the government has discussed with the various NGOs on the borrowing of the camps operated for them for use as temporary quarantine facilities. If so, of the details, including the party initiating the discussion, if not the reasons for that. And three, whether before the onset of the current outbreak of the epidemic, it had drawn up a standing list of the properties of government and NGOs which were suitable for use as temporary quarantine facilities so that the sufficient quarantine facilities might be provided expeditiously when there was an outbreak of an epidemic, if so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Food and Health. President, coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19 is an unprecedented virus which largely highly contagious and fast spreading around the world, and the upper situation is evolving rapidly. To cope with the outbreak of COVID-19, the government has adopted a strategy of containment with specific measures to achieve the purpose of early identification, early isolation, and early treatment, as well as a suite of measures to reduce population mobility and in-population social contacts. Apart from admitting patients confirmed or suspected to have been infected to hospitals for isolation and treatment, putting close contacts who may have been exposed to the risk of contracting COVID-19, but are nonetheless asymptomatic, including close contacts of confirmed cases under compulsory quarantine at quarantine centers is also a crucial element of the anti-epidemic work. With the view of effectively responding to novel infectious disease, including COVID-19, the government has formulated the preparedness and response plan for the novel infectious disease of public health significance which clearly set out the investigation and control measures under different response levels. The Department of Health will get prepared in collaboration with the Leisure and Cultural Services Department, LCSD, to transform suitable holiday camps into quarantine center as and when necessary. The rapid development of the outbreak in Hong Kong and around the world since the end of January this year has led to a surge in demand on quarantine facilities, including successive occurrence of local infection cases, surge in imported cases, increased proportion of close contact persons among confirmed cases, the need to bring back Hong Kong residents who were stranded in Hubei province and those on the Diamond Queen's cruise as well as the immediate evacuation for the purpose of disease investigation of infection cases, etc. In this connection, and since the suitable holiday camps could only provide a limited number of quarantine units, there have been a pressing need for the government to provide a large number of quarantine facilities within a short time. And the government has been looking for suitable sites in full steam since late January. When searching for sites for setting up quarantine facilities, an interdepartmental team would conduct assessment on every possible site to thoroughly examine whether the location and facilities of the sites meet the requirements for use as quarantine centers. Among other, it is crucial for the facilities to be ready for use within an extremely short period of time. As such, priority would go to premises under the ownership and management of the government when considering suitable sites. Indeed, we are very grateful to the suggestion offered by different sectors of society and NGOs on possible sites for use as quarantine centers over the period. 
and have rented individual sites deemed suitable for such use after consideration. Nonetheless, suitable sites de meeting the aforesaid requirements are limited. As of 15th of 19th of May, the government has set up quarantine centers at the following sites. One, Lady Meklehose Holiday Village, providing 45 units. Two, Polyong Kok Jockey Club Pak Tiam Chung Holiday Camp, providing 25 units. See, um, Chai Wan Lei Yu Moon Park and Holiday Village, including constructed units at basketball court and football field, providing 379 units. And four, Heritage Lodge at Chao Zhong Yi Academy, providing 53 units. Five, Junior Police Call Permanent Activity Center in Pak Hyung, providing 208 units. And six, Chun Yong Estate, providing 3,121 units. Among the above, two smaller quarantine facilities, namely the Meili Mekle Host Holiday Village and the Paul Leong Kok Jockey Club Pak Tam Chung Holiday Camp were no longer used for housing close contact since early March to achieve better deploy manpower deployment and utilization of facilities. In the light of the rapid and volatile development of COVID-19, it is difficult to accurately predict the demand on quarantine facilities. Therefore, we must plan ahead and continue to increase provision of quarantine facilities as far as possible. The government has also been setting up additional quarantine facilities through construction work at other sites. Construction works for providing 99 quarantine units at Sai Kong Outdoor Recreational Center has been completed. As to the government site at Penny's Bay, it is expected the works will be completed by July, providing some 800 units. In addition, the government will also construct quarantine units at the site reserved for future tourism development at Penny's Bay and is making preparations to kickstart the works concerned. According to preliminary estimation, additional 700 units could be provided by September. Thanks to the concerted effort and support across different parties in the community, the government has been able to increase thousands of quarantine units within a short period of time. In the long run, we consider it necessary to set up permanent quarantine facilities in Hong Kong in preparation for any possible outbreaks of disease in the future. We would review the overall situation after the current outbreak and assess the long-term quarantine needs in Hong Kong in order to make early preparations for other possible outbreaks of diseases. Thank you, President. Dr. Leung. President, I'm glad at the last part of the secretary response that claim would like to plan ahead and make early preparation. As we now know that at Chunjong Estate and Chao Zhong Yi Academy, well, there are backlash from the nearby residents and soon-to-be occupants. While identifying quarantine camps, you seem to be a hasty and ill-considered and failed to learn from the 2003 SARS report. Now that the WHO has stated that this COVID-19 could become endemic, and the arrival of the vaccines may or may not control the virus, in this case, would the government consider setting up permanent uh, specialized quarantine facilities for those who need to undergo quarantine or to isolate the patients? And the location should be away from residences. In this way, well, just in case you state it is quite as volatile, well, Hong Kong has been quite fortunate. Well, what if a few years later, we get another round of outbreak. You should be totally prepared. And you can also choose some remote locations so that you will not uh, stir up so many public backlash. I wonder if the Secretary have been thinking along those lines. Secretary, thank you, Dr. Leung's question. The government has adopted this philosophy. Well, back after 2003 SARS, in our preparedness plans, we have set aside, let's say, the uh, Lei Yu Moon Park and Holiday Village, or a smaller size Holiday Village as quarantine facilities. The scale is different from this current outbreak. 
Thus, this has been our mindset. However, learning from this episode and the whole experience and the pandemic situation, like Dr. Leung said, well, this time we have made a lot of create a lot of new facilities. For example, at Chen Yong Estate. Well, uh, it should be uh, turned over back to your housing authority at a suitable time. However, for permanent facilities, that now that we have enhanced our knowledge of this disease and the WHO and other experts also see that this virus may coexist with us for quite some time, thus we may have no idea whether there will be uh, any future infectious disease. So pointing facilities as a key aspect of tackling infectious disease. So while we're building new facilities, especially like Dr. Lensek, which are away from communities, that will be considered. It uh, depends on the overall situation of the current outbreak and also a set of permanent facilities. As for the number of units provided and the exact location, we need to carefully study and consider them. Yan Chen. Thank you, President. Uh, I'd like to ask about Chen Yong Estate, Secretary. At the early phase of the outbreak, well, well things would get very critical that that we're all willing to uh, vacate the Chen Yong Estate as the quarantine center. While the soon be occupants, well, no matter how reluctant they all feel the need to save Hong Kong, now that things have pretty uh, eased and a lot of the Restriction measures have been relaxed. According to Secretary, the Chung Yang estate will be turned over at a suitable time. Secretary, can you state it clearly? That can you tell within this month when the Chung Yang will be returned? Well, because a lot of should be occupants, including those in Cali West or even other districts, they'll be waiting to uh, move in for over 10 years. The, the, now that uh, the word that went to transfer school in September, I asked the secretary two weeks ago. I hope that the secretary can state where that within this month you can tell us that when the Chen Yongcheng can be returned, and just some piece of information that the a lot of government campsites, including the uh, suspended NGO website, there are twenty four of those, and the NGOs would have facilities about uh, nineteen of those. Please make better use of this. Outlying islands or those in remote areas, so they can turn over to your state ASAP. Okay, thank you, President and Ms. Chan's question. All along, besides that, we hit the peak that where we have uh, uh, received a lot of cases, and Chongyang estate occupancy back then it was quite high, and now that we have uh, increased places elsewhere and and uh, a lot of units will soon be cons completed in July and later. Even though the local pandemic situation had eased somewhat uh, for COVID-19 being still a global pandemic, it's difficult to predict the situation elsewhere. And we must closely monitor the overall development and also need to reserve a large number of quantity facilities to handle a potential close contacts and you may also notice that those returning from high risk areas and the quarantinees for example uh, Pakistani and Indian returnees in light of this to Chunyang estate as a quarantine center as for when we can vacate it very much depends on the development of the outbreak and also the government's closely monitoring of the outbreak and at a suitable juncture the Department of Health will uh, vacate the Chongyang estate units and would uh, thoroughly sterilize the units and the housing department also will complete the maintenance work so that this estate can be ready for population intake. Thank you President. Mr. Jeffrey Lam. Thank you, President. First, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank 
the healthcare workers for uh, uh, doing a great service to Hong Kong throughout this period. I think the government policies have also been effective. Even though these have been effective, I could see that the commercial industry sector is still in great difficulty. The HKCCC uh, expect a very pessimistic situation. Please ask your question. Please ask your follow-up question, Mr. Lam. And for the uh, cross-border quarantine, so earlier I proposed the government to exempt the 14-day quarantine requirement, and the government had already made such announcement that they were, will do so. However, for the mainland and Macau, the 14 days quarantine requirement is still in place. The chief executive has stated and also have uh, discussed with the authorities. So, may I ask the secretary, the CE claimed that they'll be liaising with the relevant authorities. So, what's the progress? Because uh, this is really vital for an economic revival. And I know the government have done quite a few measures in this. Well, uh, the earlier it could be implemented, the better it could be. If, And also the mutual recognition is also an um, important manifestation of the GBA. Mr. Lai, your question is nothing to do with the main question. Well, for quarantine, you need facilities like Chunyang Estate. Well, you can do away the quarantine requirements. Uh, I suppose that they also help with the quarantine facilities. And also, the secretary can respond to my question on the quarantine exemptions and when we can achieve reach of both sides can reach a consensus. I can briefly respond to Mr. Lam. Well, for the cross-border travel, we had amended the regulations earlier and adding two more exempted groups. As I know that the relevant policy bureau, in light of the latest exemptions, have also drawn up some planning. Uh, to facilitate necessary exchanges. And after has on the last amendment exercise we also empowered the director of health that for the Hong Kong side For those who already show proof of quarantine upon their return to Hong Kong, have they already performed virus testing and got a negative result, they also empowered the director to waive the quarantine requirement. Just now, Mr. Lan mentioned that the main plan with us on a joint prevention and control mechanism, we have initiated discussion to see how the uh, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, and Macau can achieve uh, mutual recognition of the quarantine and also the recognition of test results. Let's say some cross-border truck drivers, such arrangement is already in force. Then this discussion is still underway. First, we have to uh, uh, achieve consensus on uh, recognition of documents and all three sides have also adopted a different quarantine procedure. For example, Guangzhou province, they uh, use the green, the health codes and which require a recognition on Hong Kong and Macau that we must go through some procedures and system design. So we are currently beginning in earnest uh, on the necessary arrangements to achieve mutual recognition. And Mr. Lam, that we are already working full steam. Mr. Vincent Cheng, President, 
I would like to follow up on uh, Chunyang Estate and the Regal Oriental Hotel. We understand uh, well, well, there's an exigency at the uh, initial phase, and now you see that Penny's Bay could be completed soon, and yet a lot of residents are waiting to move in, especially those who live in subdivided units. They hope that they could uh, move in ASAP, and school is coming in September. Those who are living uh, far away from Fo Chan, they would like to arrange to student children going into school. I hope that you can arrange the Chanyang Chi can be vacated for population intake. In the case of Regal Oriental Hotel, well, the nearby residents see that as far from ideal because it's too close to a uh, local community. Would the government consider other hotels well, uh, further away from residences so that the Regal Oriental Hotel can be um, returned back to normal use? Thank you, President, and Mr. Chang's question. First, Chunya Estate we uh, cared about the would be occupants. Besides monitoring the pandemic situation, we hope that we can vacate the Chunya Estate as soon as possible and return it to the housing department. Well, currently, there are still uh, housing high-risk individuals for quantities, for example, the Pakistani and Hong Kong re Indian in returnees. From what I know, there are still more returning from those countries. And we are building new quarantine facilities. As soon as these new facilities Uh, uh, we're ready for the commission that we shall uh, address the Chunyang Chun situation as soon as possible. As for, we are currently commissioning the Rig Orient Hotel as a temporary holding center. This is not a quarantine center, per se. Uh, we understand that uh, the, the residents and the nearby shops and the district council had. Um, some views on that. We will try to explain them as soon as possible. As for where though we need to set up more holding centers, which very much depends on the number of arrivals in making suitable arrangements. As Members for mo Members' motion on subsidiary legislation six.